God and we made some strides. We're not at number one, but we still are not in a good position because we're still among the top five countries of the highest suicide rate in the world. So we are therefore uh, grateful to the Lord that now is the time. Uh, though we've waited this for such a long time, we're very grateful that they're here now. And their ministry uh, so far has been a ministry that has been well received. And I have no doubt that their presentation today, their ministry today to us, the Lord will use them to speak to us and even beyond today, um, all that God has in store. So let's put our hands together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great, thanks. So, Sister Peter, you're going to start first. Thank you very much. Let's put our hands together again for her. I thought he was coming for us. You know, yesterday was his birthday. And he worked all day yesterday on his birthday. And um, so passionate about what he's doing. So it tells me that whether birthday or not, it's every day for Jesus. So thank you very much for giving us that time, even in such a remarkable way. Amen. Thank you very much, Brother Desmond. <laughs> Greetings to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord, church. Huh? Where are you? Let's try that again. Praise the Lord, church. Amen. That sounds more like it. It's really good to be here with you in Guyana. As you've heard, we've been praying for a long time about the opportunity to come to Ghana. We've been praying for four years. And God finally opened the door for us to come and partner with Brother Desmond and to do whatever it is that the Lord has led us here to do. Because what we saw was a kind of Macedonia call, you know, and God opened up the door for us to be here. So we are really very grateful and excited that we can be here with you. And of course, it was wonderful to share Donovan's birthday in a new country yesterday. It was really a good time. So praise God. I'm going to start off. I'm not talking much today. All I'm doing today is basically reading the word. So if you want to hear me say anything about anything, you have to come out tomorrow. All right? How many of you are coming tomorrow? To the, to the library? Yes, let me see those hands. Okay, some of you are working, I gather. But if you can come in the afternoon, if you can't make it in the morning, come in the afternoon. All right. The word of the Lord for us this morning is taken from Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 33. Acts 16, 16 to 33. Will you please stand for the reading of the word? And it's from the New International Version. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs 
unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself! We're all here! The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he and his whole household came to believe in God. This is the word of the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Will you please welcome with me Dr. Donovan Thomas, all the way from Kingston, Jamaica. Wow. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you. Be seated, please. We have been here since Thursday. And it feels like we've been here for a week or more. We have just uh, been experiencing the hospitality and we are very grateful. Thank you, Pastor Desmond and the team for uh, planning and hosting us. I said thanks earlier when Sister Bev was here. I had some Japanese, some Guyanese food for breakfast. What is it again? Pepper pot and um, and um, dash um, bread. What bread is that again? Cassava bread and those kinds of stuff. So we have been sampling the the, the, the food, and uh, of course I know roti. All right, so we had our roti too and so forth. But we've really just um, enjoyed the time. Of service with you and we are just in the middle um, of our trip here and we don't get back home until the 11th of June we ask you to be praying with us as we move into Trinidad the, the church that will be hosting us actually had somebody that died by suicide uh, a few months ago so we're stepping into that situation we're doing parenting um, suicide prevention happiness and talking about what do you do when the questions are more than the answers. It's also great to have my friend from high school, um, my sister Ivan Newland, who is now going to be working, who is going to be working here for a while, as she has said uh, before. Um, I spent 30 years working with Youth for Christ. I got involved in Youth for Christ when I was in high school. I thought that was going to be that's where I'd spend the rest of my life. But during 
my course of study, I realized that there was an issue of suicide and suicidal propensity among Jamaican teenagers. And God has called us to stand in the gap, to start an organization called Choose Life International. And uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, we started Choose Life International. Our flagship is uh, suicide prevention. And uh, we look at the scriptures, we realize that the scripture had something to say about suicide. And this morning, this afternoon, we're going to be talking about the rescue mission. The portion of scripture we have read is no doubt a, a familiar portion to many. Um, this is what our logo looks like. Um, we like to think that at the center is this person representing the cross. We like to think that we are empowered by the Spirit of God represented by the dove. We like to think that um, we are in the basis of helping people to turn their backs upon the turbulent waters of life and instead of jumping off, decide that they're going to worship God. And what a joy it has been to see many people change their minds about killing themselves. Our tagline is helping people live. We believe that God has called us to help people live physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And uh, we praise God for the opportunities that he has given us to serve here and other nations. Our website is there, www.chooselifeintl.org. I don't want to invite you if you'd like to keep up, if you'd like to receive our regular newsletters, our monthly newsletters, you can just go to the website and add yourself. We also have a book table outside. My first book, Confronting Suicide, Helping Teens at Risk, um, is, I didn't have enough copies to take it for sale, um, but we, there's one page in that book with an acrostic called Geared to Live, and that book has been expanded to, a, to another book, and there are 14 of us who wrote that book. So every letter represents a principle. Every principle is explained in a chapter. So that's a very useful book. It's called Gear to Live, 12 Keys to Happiness. It is actually $4,000. $4,000, is that it? $4,000, 20 US. $4,000 sounds plenty. But yeah, $4,000. And I hear people are asking, um, are there going to be copies in the, in the bookstore? Brother Desmond, you can help us decide on that. And also, we're contemplating establishing well, put it this way. We're trying to discern the, the, the will of the Lord regarding establishing Choose Life International here in Guyana. And if you'd like to be a part of the team to help us think that through, pray that through, work that into fulfillment, if that is the perceived will of the Lord, we ask you to sign my book outside and give us some contact information. So, we are in the business of helping people live physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And we saw in the scripture that was read by faith that there was some intervention there. And uh, before we go any further, I'd like to ask us to just take a moment and pray. And I probably need the prayers more than you do. Let's take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to share again in your house of worship. Thank you for the men and women that you have brought together today in this place. Thank you for those who have come from far and near. We pray your blessings, God. I pray that you speak to me, that I may speak to your people. I ask God that you'll guide and direct, that you'll fulfill purpose, even our time of interaction. Be glorified again, God, as we say thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. So the title for today's interaction is the rescue mission. Jesus came into this world to rescue people from sin. God is at work in this world. And the work that Jesus is doing is similar to the work that God is doing. And the work that we want to be a part of is the work that God is doing in, this, in the nations of the world. So we don't want to run counter to what God is doing. We believe that it is indeed our mandate to participate in the work that Jesus is doing. He says, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And we 
want to share with you along that today. There are three words that can easily form the outline for our little interaction. It is context, caution, and consequence. Context, caution, and consequence. In the context, we recognize that this in the biblical context, we recognize that Paul and Silas were on their way to a place of prayer. And the devil turned up. Anybody know that even when we're on our way to a place of prayer, the devil turns up? Any wife and husband here ever going to church and you're quarreling on the way to church and you get out of the, the vehicle, you park, you come outside and you meet Brother Desmond and Brother Desmond, how are you today? And the wife wipes off the frown of her face and says, I am too blessed to be stressed. Yeah. So even on our way to the place of worship, we can see the attack of the enemy. Paul were on, on Silas were on their way to a place of prayer when they were met by a female who had this, a spirit by which she predicted the future. She followed Paul and the rest of us because the author of the book of Acts is now a part of the team. And he's identifying himself, and that's the author who um, sent uh, Dr. Luke. And this female were, was making comments like, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way of salvation. It sounds like a good message, but the source was wrong. Paul took some time to contemplate and to think through and this lady kept on with this for a while. Then Paul finally became troubled and he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And there are some of us who need to take authority in the name of Jesus over principalities and power set over our lives. I recognize that there are many people who like to join the prayer line and who like to people to pray for them. But how many of us know that as believers, God has given us authority in the, in his, in the name of Jesus to stand against principalities and powers. So we are from very conservative background, uh, church background, and we came across this young lady who uh, finally became a part of our family, lived with us for five years. And she really just needed help. And what we didn't know is that she was a Satanist. In fact, she was a deaconess in the Satan church. She became a part of our family because we thought she had psychological needs and, and so forth. And one of the things that we would do is that we'd call up all these um, prayer partners and these guys who are on the forefront of deliverance ministry. And we'd call them every time she started acting out. And they would come and we probably had three phones at home that time and we would be on three phones, two of us on three phones, trying to, to hear what to do now, what to do now, what to do now. But there came a weekend when it was holiday weekend and we couldn't find these guys. So now God, what do we do? So we decided that we're going to do what we saw them um, doing and what they told us to do. And we took authority in the name of Jesus and we learned one of the greatest lessons of the Christian faith. That when the child of God stands in the name of Jesus, we stand on victory ground. But we have got to be careful, you know, because the sons of Sceva, they deal with some people, right? Yeah. And, but we have to make sure that our lives are clean. That we are walking before God. And at that moment, the spirit left her. So there are some spirits of darkness that are hovering over some of us. Then we need to take authority in the name of Jesus. There are some of you who are under pressure. There are some of you who are having thoughts that are not your own. And we want to take authority in the name of Jesus. As the biblical context continues, men lost their source of income. Men of God were attacked by the mob. Innocent men were stripped and beaten severely. These innocent brother Paul and brother Silas. These brothers were being imprisoned unfairly. They are in prison and a man, a father, a husband pulled a weapon 
to kill himself. That's the biblical context. Now let's take a look. Well, in the midst of Thanksgiving, someone in the same building at the same time is attempting to kill himself. It is very possible that while some are celebrating in our homes, there are others who want to kill themselves. It is quite possible that while others are celebrating at school and in our workplaces and even our churches, there are others who want to kill themselves. At the same time, different kinds of reaction. Let's take a look at some of the personal issues that we face. There are many of us who are hurt. And as I've worked with young people over many years, I've discovered that 40% of them have said they have been hurt by the very people that they expect to protect them. Some of us feel helpless and there is evil hate. Sometimes our personal context is characterized by desperation, depression and despair, anger, unresolved issues and even unforgiveness. There is pain, powerlessness and problems. Sometimes doom and gloom, rejection, regrets, and ritualism. Sometimes we just go through the motion because it is Sunday. We know it is time to go to church. But we are hurting deep within. And church people know how to mask their hurts and pain. We just fake it and hope that one day we'll make it. But sometimes we are filled, we are just full filled with, the, with pretense because we don't want people to know what's going on with us. As we look at the societal context, we realize that there's violence. And yes, I left violence in Jamaica and I came to Guyana and we are hearing about the violence. It's all around. Sometimes there is fear and intimidation, drugs and alcohol abuse, gang warfare, Sexual inappropriate behavior, negative impact of the media, breakdown in family system, eroded values, and sometimes suicide close to home. And suicide is on the increase in many nations in our world. Do you know that, did you know that approximately one million people die annually by suicide? So think about the, whole, the, the, the one million people. You do not even have one million people in your country. And all of the population in this country die by suicide every year. And the number of persons you have in this country is less than the number of persons around the world that dies by suicide. That's a lot. And for every person that dies by suicide, there are 25 attempts. So 25 or 26 million people attempt 25 million people attempt and 1 million die by suicide. And for every person that attempts suicide or dies by suicide, at least 60 people are impacted significantly. Every 40 seconds, somebody dies by suicide. Even in the great United States of America, they are seeing significant increase. In, in fact, the rates are higher than they have seen in the last 30 years. In 20. Uh, in 06, up to, up to 2014, there's a, an annual increase of 2% from 30,000 uh, up to 45,000 over that period of time. And many people think, if I just get to the U.S., my problems are solved. I just want a U.S. visa. And they think it is heaven. But even the U.S. people are killing themselves. In Jamaica, between 2013 and 2017, 259 uh, people took their own lives. As we try to do the calculation, I realize that you're seeing probably close to 250 persons dying by suicide every year in this country. And that is cause for concern. In Guyana, in 2016, we were talking about 30 per 30.2 persons per 100,000. That's back in 2016. At that time, you, were, you had the highest rate of suicide in the world. And at one stage, the, the rate of suicide in Guyana 
was four times the world's average. That's cause for concern. It is good that you are no longer in first place in this, but you are way up there still. You are at uh, third place. The highest we have seen down here is 30.2. But now you are at you are at 29, 29.2. What has happened is that some other people have overtaken you too. But the fact that there are more people, that they have higher rates, should not make us comfortable in any way. There is lots of work to be done to be able to rescue those who are hurting to the point that they want to kill themselves. And I realize that I share the ethnicity of the majority of those who are killing themselves here. 80% of those who die by suicide are from Indian descent. And no wonder Brendan Bain said to me some time ago, Donovan, you are, you are specifically picked out to work with, with the people in Guyana in helping deal with the issue of suicide prevention. When we look at what's happening in the Caribbean, Guyana, um, this is from 20, up to 2009, Guyana um, was top of the list. Regrettably, Guyana still remains at the top of the list with Suriname in second place in the Caribbean. This is information produced by PAHO. And what we have found is that Trinidad has jumped up to third position. And there is cause for concern because more and more people are dying by suicide. And notice we have some brothers and sisters from the African continent. There is a call that has been coming from the African continent saying we need help. Got a, a, a video recently of um, sent by Ken, from Kenya saying this is what is going on. People are taking their own lives, and we are thinking about our three country tour next year in 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 um, Africa, um, in Kenya, Tanzania, and Zambia is what the people are talking to us right now. Who kills themselves more, males or females? How many of you were at the seminars yesterday? Anybody? All right, so you would have had quite a bit of information there. So we're going to say, just point out quickly, that more men kill themselves. Many more men die by suicide. This is what the chart looks like for Jamaica, a page from one of my books there. As we look in Guyana, what we find again is that the 2016 report shows that for every female that dies by suicide, three 0.28 males die by suicide. So it's close to the world's ratio of one female to four males. Why do we have more males killing themselves? As we had that discussion last night, we realized that there are some things that they told us. That one, their psychological factor. More men internalize stuff. The women will talk about what's bothering them. And sometimes the women chat plenty, but talk can be therapy, all right? But also, men don't believe, most men don't want to uh, share what's going on um, with them. So they lock it up, sometimes they go down the road and they're smoking or drinking, and after that high wears off, we're still faced with the problems. Then sometimes the economic factor drives more men to kill themselves. When men feel as if they cannot feel fulfill their obligations in the context of home and otherwise, they sometimes feel that, you know, it is better off dead than not being able to meet those obligations. And sometimes we cause these problems on ourselves. One man came to me sometime ago and said, Dr. Thomas, sometimes I feel like I want to kill myself. I said, yeah, help me understand what's going on. And the Jamaican dialect, dialect he said, my baby mother, them are pressure me. That means my baby mothers are pressuring me. Sometimes our own doing. And then religious factors. Where there is strong religious conviction, there tends to be lower suicide rate. And that needs to be taken very cautiously in this kind of context. Because we do not support anything that say, kill yourself if you're going through problems and you come back in a better form. I found that Christianity actually uh, raises the, actually provides more capacity 
for people to get help. So, in the what is the largest religion in in Guyana? Christianity. When you go to the place of worship, what's the name of the place of worship of the Christians? Church. When you get to the church, you have more males or females. Many more females know that this too will pass. That God is not going to give them more than what he's prepared to help them bear. That even though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes in the vine, no cat in the pen, yet they can rejoice in the Lord. And then there's socialization factor. Two three-year-olds are playing, a boy and a girl. Both of them fall. How does the average person in your country respond to the boy? How does the average person in your country respond to the girl? Most times, we pick up the girl, we brush her off, we give her a little kiss. Hush, darling, don't cry. What do we do to the, to the boy? What do we do with the boy? Slap your name, man, be tough. And we are teaching our boys from very early that it is inappropriate to express feelings. In our churches, in our homes, in our schools, in our communities. Let's allow our children, and boys and girls, to talk about their hurts and their pain. And to help them find healing. So those are four factors. Males are four times more likely to die from suicide than females. However... Females are more likely to attempt suicide than males. More ma females attempt because every suicide attempt is a cry for help. Who cries for help more? Males or females? Females generally. Yeah, but they use less drastic means. One young lady called home one, one morning and said, Antifaith, Antifaith, I just took an overdose and I changed my mind about killing myself. The man doesn't get that chance because he uses more drastic means. He uses the, the gun or the rope or the poison. All right? So, that's the context we're dealing with now. Let's look at some other caution. We hear, we look at the context and we realize that a man was about to kill himself and Paul issued a caution. Paul said to him, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Wouldn't it be great if that's a message that all of us who are a part of the church send out to our brothers and sisters out in the world? Don't harm yourself. We are all here. I say to you, sir, I say to you, madam, your presence should make a difference. But even in the church, we find people who are hurting. I want to say to you, let's encourage, when we issue that shout, I want to encourage you to issue that shout that we can encourage people to resist. Don't harm yourself. When Paul said to, to the jailer, shouted to the jailer that they were there, it, it gave them the strength to resist. If you know that you're not alone in your struggles, it is easier to walk the path. I say to us, let's make an effort to be our brother's keepers. Sometimes, especially the young people in the church, feel that they are too easily criticized. I want to say to you, before you spit out those words, taste them. Because sometimes our words can be so bitter. Church people sometimes just tell them a piece of our mind. But we don't, or we are not cautious about how we speak our mind. When Paul issued a shout, it said to the jailer, there is strength to resist. Let's look out for those who may be vulnerable and issue that shout for help. In the context, when that shout was issued, it also offered clarity. It said to the jailer, what you think is wrong. You're thinking that windows are open, Doors are open, chains are broken, so prisoners are gone. He was relying on his own mental, rational ability. But God does not always work with the rational. When God says to us, one plus one equals one, can you work that out? But that's what he says in the context of marriage. Two become one. So there are possibilities 
with God outside of what we think with our human minds. And we had a missionary who came from came to Jamaica some years ago and he left the slogan with us possibilities belong to us impossibilities belong to God. So when we're up against the struggle that seems to shatter all our dreams just remember there, there is possibility with God. Paul shouted we are all here that provided clarity. Sometimes we just have to clear up some things for some people. Sister over there would want them to know that it is not true that if you kill yourself, you're going to come back in a better form. We want to take time out to offer clarity about this thing. As we look at the context, Paul not only issued the, clar the clarity, he not only encouraged resistibility, but he's indicated that they were available. We are all here. Oh, that we will be available to provide support to the hurting, to the helpless, to the powerless behind us, beside us and the people that we know. Jesus himself was going up and about, up and about the community. And when he went into communities, he was moved with compassion because he saw people who were helpless and powerless. He looked at them and something from deep down within went out to a set of people who were in need. And he said, Behold, the fields are white and ready to harvest. So it is here still to this day. He says, Pray ye the Lord of the harvest, that he send workers out into his harvest field. Let's issue the caution. Encourage resistibility. Offer clarity. And let's be available to help somebody. The song says, If I can help somebody as I walk along, then my living shall not be in vain. We were in Cuba uh, 18 months ago. A man came to me and said, Brother Donovan, pray for me. I want to go into that particular community to help people who are suicidal. We went back there April, May. And he said, Dr. Thomas, you know, over the time that you have been away, I have been able to help six people change their minds about killing themselves and they are now a part of the church. 250 people every year taking their lives in this country. I want to ask you to be available to say, God, I want to come alongside some of those who are hurting to the point that they want to take their own lives. I want to share with you that there are some things that we can do to be able to rescue them. One of the things I've found as I've worked with people who have killed them, uh, who's, who have people who have killed themselves. One of the things I've found as I've worked with people who have lost loved ones to suicide is that many times they do not know the signs. Sometimes we turn up into a, into a school community or even the workplace and many people do not know the signs. Oh, such and such a person was such a good person. Oh, he seems, he seems so happy or she seems so happy. But they didn't realize that they were drinking things behind the scene. Sometimes it is alcohol that triggers it. But I want to say to my brothers and sisters, every threat must be taken seriously. A threat can be overt or it can be subtle. A, a threat can be brazen and up in the face that says, if you ever leave me, I'm going to kill myself. Or if I, if you ever, if I ever fail my chemistry exam, I'm going to kill myself. But sometimes it can be subtle. One young lady came to me and she just waved goodbye from my secretary's office. When I said to her, are you going back to, to the U.S.? She said, no, big broad smile. I said, you're going um, to Eastern Caribbean? No, big broad smile. Where are you going? She couldn't tell me, but she had a big broad smile. Her birthday was coming up, and she decided that she was tired of living in misery, so she was going to kill herself. She had a plan. And I said to us, the more detailed the plan, the closer the person is to the suicide act person who knows the place, knows the time, or knows the method is much more at risk than the person who 
doesn't know um, the, the person does not have a plan. Then a threat, well I said a threat already, complaints of being rotten on the inside. Persons who are talking about I am no good, I am rotten, I am useless. Those are some of the warning signs. Then people who are complaining about being a burden. Sometimes teenagers feel that they are a burden, as you can see on the board there. Being a burden to someone. Sometimes uh, children feel that they are a burden to parents and they feel that, you know what, I should kill myself. Sometimes people are experiencing unbearable pain where they just can't take it any longer. Sometimes there are health issues that sometimes after an accident people are left um, with those kinds of stuff. I want to remind us that preparation for death is a warning sign. People prepare for death in various ways. A teenager may give away the jacket or the Xbox or the bicycle. Uh, a woman having problem with her spouse, with her husband, uh, may decide to tamper with insurance documents. Withdrawal from friends and family. Giving away prized possession. Increased alcohol and drug usage. Here is a little key I want to give all of you. Wherever you are from, I want you to write these down. Take a picture of it or something. But here is a key to do assessment. Assessing severity to suicide. The P is a plan. The more detailed the plan, the closer the person is to the suicide act. The I is the intensity of the method. The, the, the more drastic the method, the more, the, the more likely the person will complete suicide. N is the nearness of the method. And S is the support. Does the per N does the person already have the means of death? And S is the support system. What type of support system does the person have? All of us can step into somebody's world and show care and concern. Am I correct? All of us can be there for the hurting persons. Here are some protective factors. Interestingly, um, academic achievement. Teenagers who are doing better in school tend to have greater resilience. Tend to. They are the exceptions. Parental connectedness is a big factor. When we connect with our children, what the research actually shows is that they have more ability to fight back in the face of suicidal thoughts during their childhood years and even into adulthood. Then closeness to caring friends. Neighborhood safety, access to local health services and other agencies where that provide um, support. Connection to other non-parental adults. So if we, are, we, we have, in this part of the world, we have many aunties and uncles in the church, right? And I want to say to us, um, sometimes as parents, we have to look at who are the power brokers in the lives of our children. And we have found that it is that we can get more done at times through working through other people that our children um, respect and honor and that kind of stuff. Because sometimes parents are not the best people to make recommendations. Am I correct? Yeah. All right. So people who feel suicidal do not want to be alone. They may pretend, they may say, leave me alone. But there's a test for you to see whether or not you're going to walk away from that. They do not want to be advised. They do not want to be interrogated. What then do they want? They want someone to listen to them. Why do we have two ears and one mouth? Why do we have so many cell phones? How many have? Three? One. All right. Why do you, people want to listen? And I say listen with your ears, with your eyes, and with your heart. They want someone to trust. They want someone to care. What's lacking? What's missing? Hope. What's missing? Self-esteem. And we have got to be very careful of how we treat our children. How we treat people around us. Because many people have fragile self-esteem. And our, our comments to them can destroy or build their self-esteem. And then what's missing? Spiritual belief. My friend Martin was a Buddhist. He went to bed one night after a quarrel with his wife. 
And in the middle of the night, he woke up and said, and took out his revolver and pointed it toward his mouth and was about to kill himself. When he remembered that his friend had said to him, Martin, only Jesus can help you. In his mind, he said, Jesus, if you are real, I want you to speak to my sleeping wife and tell her to turn over and touch me and say, darling, what's going on? Before the idea left his mind, his wife turned over in bed, touched him and said, darling, what's going on? And Martin knew that Jesus was real. When I met Martin, he was a preacher. He had given his life to Christ and such transformation took place in his life. As we go through situations in life, we want to trust Jesus, even in the midst of the difficulties. There are some persons who are part of the Christian faith who have killed themselves and others are thinking about killing themselves. I want to say to you, remember that Jesus provides a way out. I want to share with you what to do if you are suicidal. Very quickly, share your feelings with someone responsible. Notice someone responsible. Because what we are finding is that sometimes people are sharing their feelings with people who themselves are suicidal. Sometimes on the internet and so forth. And they make suicide packs and they decide to kill themselves together. If you have any weapon, hand over any weapon that you have. Disclose your friends to a trust. Disclose your plans to a trusted friend. Resist any temptation to be alone. Insist that you will not obey that devil. That voice that you hear telling you things. Many times it is the voice of the devil. I will share with you a story with a young man who came to me the day after he attempted suicide. He related that he had a fight with his brother. And after he was beaten up by his brother, he heard a voice saying to him, your brother doesn't like you. In fact, nobody in the family likes you. You should just kill yourself. Then the voice said to him, there's a rope in the cupboard. Go get the rope. Go down to that tree down there. Tie the rope over that limb. Now climb upon and get ready to jump. And just as he was about to jump, somebody saw him. He came to me as doing my usual emotional assessment with him. And I realized in the middle of what was going on, I realized that in the middle of the interview, his eyes were turning over. I could only see the white after a while. His hand was doing something like this. His head was going in a circle. And I realized I was not dealing with something psychological. I called one of my staff members and said to him, to, to him, say after me, John, not his real name, belongs to Jesus. The outright response was, John belongs to Satan. Not once, not twice, not three times. We believe in the biopsychosocial spiritual model of intervention. And there is a place for prayer. There is a place for deliverance. There is a place for us to really take authority in the name of Jesus. And this kind of suicide, the medication cannot help. The, the, the psychiatrist cannot tell. It is the people of God who need to rise up and take authority in the name of Jesus to see people healed and delivered. So I want to ask you to stand guard. I want to ask you to pray for those who are hurting. I want to ask you to pray for us even as we work with people who are hurting because we have to discern is this psychological, is it medication that the person needs or is it deliverance? That young man was set free. We prayed over him. He was delivered. He was set free. I didn't see him again um, for a while. Uh, years passed. Probably two years passed. He had gotten much taller. I turned up at a school. And he came to me and said, Dr. Thomas, you remember me? Of course I didn't remember him. And he said, I was that young man. God is able to deliver from every chain of the enemy. And we have got to rise up. The church of God. The church has a role to play in reducing the suicide rate in this country. And if all we can do is pray, let's, let's do that. Let's rise up and make our contribution. Remember that God has a way of escape. Always has a way of escape.
Remember, suicide causes more problems, not solutions. Remember, suicide is permanent. Your problem is temporary. I want to invite you to think about your eternal destiny. There are three words that begin with C. What is the first one we look at? Context. The second one? Caution. And then, very briefly, the consequence. As we look at the passage, we realize that there are some consequences for intervention. But in the context, there was the preservation of physical life. So Paul shouted, do yourself no harm. We're all here. And as a result of that, a life was spared. I trust that as we leave from here, we will issue that shout, not necessarily our voices, but with the way we treat our family members, the way we treat our friends, the way we treat our people in general, that we will be aids in the preservation of physical life. The jailer called for light, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. The only way he was able to move is because he had life. The second outcome that I want to highlight from this interaction is that there was personal interest in spiritual matters. When Paul said, do yourself no harm, there was increased interest in spiritual matters. What must I do? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Was his question. We have had the joy of seeing many people come to faith in Christ, even as we have intervened in their suicidal risk. And what joy it is to see spiritual interest in lives that were so complicated. One of the joys I have had is that people come into our office with crowds and, and pain and hurt. And even sometimes just before we pray the prayer of commitment, we say, bow your heads. And it is heart burden and heaviness. But just the raising of the head after the prayer just shows transformation has taken place. I saw some of that happening here today at the altar. One young lady in particular who came to the altar. In fact, I saw her from yesterday that I felt that God needed, that she needed to yield something to the Lord. As she came to the altar today and we prayed over her, there was transformation. I don't know what was going on in her life, but I know that she was able to smile and smile a genuine smile. Because Jesus came through for her. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let's realize that every person who is suicidal represents a possibility, another possibility for help and, in, and spiritual intervention. When somebody talks about being suicidal, we can help them and sooner or later they may be the very ones to ask what must I do to be saved. The third consequence of intervention is that there was practical demonstration of care for humanity. At that hour the jailer took them, them, Paul and Silas, and washed their wounds. He became sensitive to the fact that there were humankind who were hurting they were there before with their wounds, but there was no interest. But when God rescued him from suicide, when these people intervened, he took an interest in, the, in care for humanity. And not only did he wash their wounds, but he play, took them into his house and set a meal before them. The same persons who were suicidal, who wanted to, the same man who wanted to kill himself, is now taking care of the hurting. What a transformation. Many of our referrals back in Jamaica are from people who were hurting and who came to us and got help. Practical demonstration of care for humanity. But probably my favorite outcome when we intervene is personal and household salvation. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. Transformation took place, not just for the man who was suicidal, but for his whole family. I believe in household salvation. At age 11, I was the first one to commit my life to the Lord. In fact, as you can tell, my parents are Indians. And we have some traces of, well, four parents from India. And I grew up in a context where if there were any pra religious practices at all, it was Hinduism related. 
But there came a time when somebody took an interest in us and invited us to Sunday school. And at age 11, I gave my life to the Lord. I was the first one and the only one in, the, in, in my family to be a Christian for a few years. Until probably two years afterwards, after I came to the Lord, my two brothers came to faith in Christ. And then my mother and my, and my sister. And then my father and my brother. And if even a cousin who came to live with us came to faith in Christ. God chose me to start a transformation in that family. And then there's a next generation of young men who are, and women, who are mighty people of God. It may be that God is calling you to start something great in your family. As we wrap up today, I want to ask you, are you concerned about your family? Are you willing to say, God, I want to recommit myself to be an agent of change in my family? I heard Brother Desmond as he said, I am now taking, other, taking more interest in my biological family. I say to us, don't be a successful failure. Taking care of other people, people's children and other people out there and your own, be left unattended to. That was always one of the challenges as our children were growing up. Now they are 25 and 28. When they were younger, what if I should neglect my own? And while I'm helping with other people's children who are suicidal, they move on to kill themselves. By the grace of God, we are not at that kind of struggle. But I want to ask you today, are you willing to recommit to standing in the gap for your families? Do you have brothers and sisters and cousins and uncles and aunts and spouses and children who are not yet Christians? And they want to say, today, I want to stand in a gap for them. As we come bring this meeting to its end, I want to ask you to just stand as an act of commitment. Worship team, I'm going to ask you to come back and to do your worship song, Break Every Chain Will Be Good. But anybody here willing to say, God, I have family members who do not know you, and I want to ask you to use me as an agent of change and transformation in their families, in my family. What a joy it is to look back on 40 odd years of Christianity and to see households who have been transformed and generations transformed because God used me. You may think impossible, but God may want to do some special things in you. I want to ask you to yield yourself to him. Before I pray over you, There may be people here today who have never yet said yes to Jesus. There may be people here who have never committed their lives to the Lord. I was only 11 years old. When I prayed a prayer that says, dear Jesus, I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want to ask you to come into my life. I want to ask you to, I want to repent of every evil I've done. And I now yield my life to you. That was the simple little prayer that caused the transformation. And the beginning of great things. Almost well, over 40 years of walking with Jesus. One of the concerns that people have from time to time is that we may not make it. We may not be able to live it out. I've come to appreciate that the grip that I have on God is like I hold him by the fingernail. But he holds me around the waist and says, Donovan, I have an interest in your walk in the path. So before I pray for those who want to be missionaries going back to their own families, I'm going to pray a prayer of commitment. And if you are not yet a believer and you'd like to commit your life to the Lord, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me as your very own. Let's pray. If you're a backslider, you may want to make that commitment to the Lord too. Let's pray. Let's bow eyes closed. Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize I'm a sinner. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins and receive me as your child. I repent of every evil I've done and I now make you Lord of my life. Give me the strength to live for you in this world of evil. Help me, God, to be faithful to the very end. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Anybody pray that prayer? Just stretch that hand right up, please. You pray that prayer as a commitment to the Lord. You're not a Christian. And you pray that prayer for the first time. Are you probably a backslider? Anybody? Any 11 year will pray that prayer? Anybody? Just wave your hand right where you are. I'd like to remember you in a closing word of prayer. Just stretch it right up. Yes, I see that hand. Anybody else? Anybody else anywhere? Pray that prayer. Yes, ladies. Anybody else anywhere? Any young man? Any not so young man? Anybody else? Anybody else? Just raise your hand. Ladies, I'd like to lay hands on you and pray with you today. I'm going to ask you to make your way right down here. Those of you who raise your hand, just make your way right down here. I want to pray over you today. And then we're going to pray for those who are hurting. We're going to ask you. Um, we want to pray for you. Some of you are going through some difficult times. You may not be at the point where you want to kill yourself. But there may be struggles and hardship. Come young, young, young miss. Let's celebrate with her. Because there's rejoicing in heaven when somebody comes to faith in Christ. Yes, young lady. Yes. I know you didn't want to come up front now. But sometimes you have to step out of that and step into this. Anybody else? Anybody else? You pray that prayer. But yeah, I feel like there are two other people in there. Anybody else? You pray that prayer and you mean business with God. I don't want to invite you to just join me down here for prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray over these two young ladies today. Lord, even as they have prayed this prayer as a commitment to you, God, I pray for an inflow into their lives. I take authority against every element of darkness over their lives. I pray, God, that you would touch them. I pray, God, that you would pour into their spirits. I pray, Lord, that you would break every yoke of the enemy. Lord, I call for right now a disconnect between them and the forces of darkness. Lord, anything that they have been given to wear or to drink or anything like that, God, we cancel it out right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that breaks every yoke. Pour into their lives. Pour into their lives. Pour into their lives. I call for mighty women of God to arise. Mighty women of God arise. Touch them, God. Chart the path that their lives should go and bless as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'd like to pray for somebody here today. Some of you are going through some tough times, some challenging times. I want to ask you to make your way right down here. There may, some of, there may be some of you here who are going through periods of illness, family crisis, financial crisis. I'm going to ask you to make your way right down here. There are some of you who are hurting to the point that you know, you're becoming confused and unsure about what's going on in your own life. If you'd like for us to pray with you, in a closing word of prayer, I'm going to ask you to just make your way right down here, right now. Anybody? Let's sing that song, please. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Take your way right down here to the altar. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. And I want to invite some of the counselors to just come and stand with these young men and women who are saying, yeah, they are committing their lives to the Lord, but there are some others who are saying, you know, I'm going through some difficult times. I want to ask you to stand with them. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to pray for those who are standing. Thank you, dear. Lord, you see those who have stood up and who are standing because they want to be agents of change in their families. I pray over them right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for fresh fire. In the name of Jesus, I pray for fresh anointing over their lives. I pray, Lord, that you will give them opportunities to be able to reach out to their families that are hurting. Lord, you know the burdens that some have carried. Father, right now I pray against unforgiveness in some families. In the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you'll repair the breach. I pray, God, that you'll bless. I pray, God, that you'll strengthen. Lord, I pray that you will intervene in miraculous ways. Father, I pray for those who are at the altar because they're going through tough times. I pray, God, that you will pour in the oil and wine of healing. In the name of Jesus. I ask, God, that you'll touch them. I pray, God, that you'll pour in. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we dedicate this oil again into your hands. In the name of Jesus. We dedicate it into your hands in the name of Jesus. And Father, we just pray that you would just use it to represent you. In the name of Jesus. I pray for breakthrough over this young man. In the name of Jesus. I ask God that you'll come to his rescue. Mighty man of God, arise. Rise up out of your pain. Out of your discouragement. Rise up. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up. In the name of Jesus, I pray God that you'll pour in the oil and wine of healing. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we declare enough is enough. In the name of Jesus. Lord, there came a time when you looked when you saw the children of Israel in bondage and you declared enough is enough I have seen, I have heard I am concerned and I am ready to act I pray God that you'll do it for my brother I ask God that you'll pour in the oil and wine of healing There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. I hear the chains falling. I hear the chains falling. I hear the chains falling. See, there is power. In the name of Jesus, there is power. In the name of Jesus, there is power. In the name 
name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. I hear the chains falling. I hear the chains falling. I hear the chains falling. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain. Oh, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. See, there is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. In the name of Jesus, there is power. In the name of Jesus, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Father in heaven, we come before you again. And we pray, God, that you will break some chains from over some lives right now at the altar here. In the name of Jesus, we pray, Lord, against financial chains. We pray against unforgiveness chain. In the name of Jesus, we pray against any chain that is related to relationships, oh God. I pray, God, that you will break every chain of the enemy. We take authority against principalities and powers set over these lives in the name of Jesus and we call for a breakthrough in the heavenlies that will manifest itself upon earth. I pray for influence of their spirits, God. I call for mighty men of God and mighty women of God to arise. Rise up, rise up, rise up in the name of Jesus. I call for what stalwarts to arise. Lord, I pray against every form of illness right now in the name of Jesus. Every illness from the waist up. We take authority in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray against every spirit of darkness, God, that wants to hold some persons captive. Lord, I pray against every illness from the waist down. In the name of Jesus. And we call forth healing. Thank you, God, that you are able to do far above that which we are able to think or imagine. Father, we speak to every spirit of darkness relating to suicidal thoughts in this place. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we speak to every spirit of depression. Lord, I pray that for those who may be on the path to suicidal acts, God, I pray that you would rescue them, God. I pray over this church. I pray, Lord, that even as this church has been exposed to this teaching today, I pray, Lord, that men and women will find, will have the passion to be able to make a difference in the lives of hurting people. I pray, oh God, that from this center, there will be a flow, oh God, from this church that rescues men and women, boys and girls out in the communities. We pray, Lord, that you'll come to our rescue. Father, we pray for fresh fire. 
fresh anointing in this place. We pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, for the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit over this church. We pray, God, that you raise the bar and fulfill purpose in this place. Bless again, Lord, those who are saying yes to you today. Chart the path that their lives should go. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you have given Faith and I to share with our brothers and sisters here in Guyana. We pray, God, that you will take the little that we have to offer and multiply it into that which is of eternal value. We pray over tomorrow's seminar and Tuesday's seminar and whatever else may come, our television interview tomorrow. We ask, God, that you would bless and meet needs and fulfill purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. As there are two things I want to say before I hand back over. We are at the point where we are seeking the direction of the Lord regarding whether or not we should establish Choose Life International here in Guyana. And we want to ask anybody who may want to be a part of that team to help us think that through. Do we establish or do we form partnerships? How do we go from here? Um, I'm going to ask you to just meet me at the table outside and just give me some contact information that we can be in touch with you. Then our books are outside there. Uh, it's $4,000, as I said before. And Faith will autograph at no extra price. And if you haven't yet signed up for the seminar tomorrow, we want to encourage you to come and be a part of that. If there are people from other nations who may say, oh, this resonates with me. I may be interested in this for my country. Let's talk about it and see what God will do. Thanks again for having us. And God bless. May us make sure that we experience God and that we, we walk in the freedom that he has secured on the cross. God bless you. Thanks, Brother Jomo, for all your help, for giving me this, this screen right here in front of me that was not there yesterday. God bless you. Thank you, everybody, for hosting us so wonderfully. Right, right. Give, give, give another round of applause to Brother Daniel and um, Donovan and Sister Donovan. Man. Right, can we all stand as we about to leave? We ask Sister Barbara to close herself in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time we have with you. Every moment with you is so precious, Lord. It's transforming. And we pray that your word today would make our hearts swell for the lost, for those who are broken like you did. You came to set the captives free to heal the broken heart. Oh, Lord Jesus, may we take on, may we do what you ask us to do. In the name of Jesus, it will be become active, not passive Christians, active, and heal a broken world. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for covering us under your precious blood. Our families, thank you that you saving our households, our, our families, our children, in the name of Jesus. And we cover them under your precious blood, body, soul, and spirit. Thank you that you give your angels charge over each one of us and our households to watch over us in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the evening services. As we go into the communities, thank you souls will be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Count yourself dismissed. Please ensure that you greet our visitors as you leave.